Hey everyone, we have something really cool today and actually super rare. This is a PlayStation 4 Pro dev kit. And this one, as far as we can tell, was first powered on in 2017. It was built around February of 2017 and it only has three or four days of actual use on it. So not only rare, but also very lightly used. We're gonna be doing a teardown on this today. We also went through the operating system, went through some of the menus, and we'll be showing you some screen capture of that so you can see what it actually looks like if you were a developer using one of these. And we know a lot of people in our audience have worked with dev kits like this in the past because you've commented on some of our past videos of dev kit teardowns. So if you're one of those people, please post a comment with any anecdotes you think would be interesting or answers to things I asked during the video because we love reading the comments from you all on your own experiences with it. Okay, let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lee and Lee's Lancool 3 case. The Lancool 3 has a fully mesh front, good airflow that did well in our thermal testing earlier this year, and it's one of the most mechanically advanced cases we've ever reviewed. The Lancool 3 balances ease of installation features, thermal performance, and cable management in a competitive case market. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is just an external walk around to take a look at this. Uh, I personally haven't seen one of these before we got this one, so might as well show it off externally. And then we'll talk about some of the internal specs as we tear it down and go over some of the software caps that we got as well. So starting with the front of this thing, it's got an interesting faceplate. This is clearly different from the standard PlayStations. We'll drop something on screen at some point to show you a more standard PlayStation 4 in case you've forgotten. And uh, certainly far different from the PS5, which we've also torn down. But this was back in the disk era, so there's a disk drive, optical drive up here. All right, so just for comparison, here is the consumer Sony PlayStation 4 Pro. So this is what it would look like if you were to buy it on the market or back when it was new. Uh, some cutouts on the side for a little bit of ventilation. We never took this one apart, but I.O. is on the back as is somewhat standard. Most of the I.O. matches what we have on the unit here next to me, but it's not exactly the same. Some USB on the front. And otherwise, uh, pretty basic. It was designed to stand or lay flat on its side. And it's much skinnier than what we're taking apart today, where the dev kit is probably kitted out with some more hardware. It has far more cooling capacity. So just looking at this thing externally, starting on the back of it, uh, it's not the most venting in the world, but this is a big Dr. Grill cutout in the back of the case. and. We'll see it once I take it apart, but if you were to look down in there, you would actually see that's where the fin stack is. The fin density is not too high, so they're pretty spaced apart, but that can be an intentional and useful design depending on how they've done it. This is probably up for the power supply, so all the power supply topology will be in there. And this is some venting for the PSU that might also share with the PSU, which we'll look at shortly. And getting back to some of the simpler stuff for a moment, for I.O., so hard drives right here as far as we understand it, which we'll find out soon once I try to take that out. For the rest of it, there's two Ethernet ports. One is called DevLAN or local area network. There's another RJ45 or Ethernet port right there. There's a Dev USB, that's a uh, type B connection. And then there's auxiliary, which we think is for a camera, uh, like for VR. There's another USB port. So there's three on the front. There's one here on the back that marks four here on the inscription. HDMI, and then uh, just sort of standard optical or digital out. The front of it is really interesting though. So they've got this brushed aluminum plate. It's very thin metal here, just, well, from what I can tell externally. It seems to be mostly glued onto the plastic, uh, maybe tacked in somewhere. And we've got a bunch of LEDs. They, we've seen them light up green and red. We don't know if there's a particular meaning. They're numbered from zero to seven. So if you're one of those developers in the audience, we'd be curious about that. I'm assuming you could, you could feed debug codes through there or other useful information since there's so many of them. You could also just use a post buzzer or something. Over here, there's uh, eject because again, it's got an optical drive, reset, and then on and standby. And then we've got some buttons here you can press with a, a pin or something and uh, reset or get access to uh, system and memory or uh, network information. And then there's a status LED there. And then the rest of the USB is over there. A little bit of venting on the top and the bottom of the center of this console. So that's where it's kind of interesting. This is built to be stacked like many of the others we've looked at in the past. 
including the recent PS5 uh, dev kit, which we actually haven't personally gotten. So if you have one, reach out to tips, T-I-P-S, at gamersnexus.net, and we would like to get that from you. But this one, it's uh, designed so that you can actually set in the feet of another one of these right on top of it. It has a little indicator icon on it that tells you, hey, it goes in here. So it's not like it's just been ripped out and it's the rubber is missing that is designed that way so that the bottom of one of these can socket in on top of another so they can build a big rack of them and use them in development environments. And theoretically, uh, some of these in the past have been designed for even rack mounting, although this one does not appear to be. This is not uh, venting, so that's just like a deco plate, basically. It doesn't, there's no actual holes or air throughput there. Same for the other side, nothing interesting there. So on the software side, some interesting stuff. First of all, this has some forensics in it. It's got data logging. And we saw that the dev kit had not been connected to the internet since at least 2019, other than when the most recent purchaser turned it on to see if it worked. And the system clock was less than an hour off uh, and it was already flagged as expired when we turned it on. So unfortunately, the system is not functional as a dev kit anymore. They've disabled that functionality. The kit was first booted in 2017. It was, as far as we could tell, rarely used. It only saw three or four days that it was actually turned on and in working uh, progress on something. It also seems like this one only ever launched VR demo applications. And based on the naming of the system, it looks like maybe it came from some kind of medical software developer or something like that. As far as gaming, the dev kit won't launch games. We can't sign into PSN. We can't pull online system updates, maybe because standard update files are incompatible with the dev kit, and we just weren't successful in getting any games to run on this. Okay, so time to start the teardown. This is gonna be on, uh, I know we need some Torx 9. That's a hell of a screw. Just digging into the plastic for that one. Very coarse threads. Okay, so there's only two for the top here, and then we're gonna have a bunch of these recessed ones down on the sides. All right, we've loosened most of those. I just realized I wanted to get the drive out before we proceed here, so we're gonna remove that next. All right, a couple of Phillips had one screws with the blue heads, it makes them easy to remember. This looks like it might, yep, I was gonna say that might just be a tab to pull it out. So loosening those two gave us this small, basically lever to help remove it. And that revealed a hard drive in laptop form factor. So it's two and a half inch drive, it's on SSD though. It's an HGST drive. And this particular one is one terabyte at 5,400 RPM. So on the slower side, but probably fine for what they're doing. And I, that's really, oh, it's a SATA three gigabit per second as well. So it's actually not even uh, SATA six gigabit per second. So as for, is this special compared to the normal consumer PS4 Pro? The answer is no. From what we understand, this is the same as the stock standard consumer PS4 Pro. And they're still using it here. Oh, that might be really easy. That'd be nice. Let's see. Wow. That was uh, remarkably simple to get the top of this off. So just points of interest on here, the inside of the plate, so normally you have markings for manufacturer and date. So this was made by Foxconn. They make most <laughs> consumer products. All right, so we're in the first part of the interior here and I'm seeing some shielding. This is a power supply as a module. So that's kind of one of the things consoles have done that works out well lately is it, hopefully this is just one of those socketable ones. I see two screws further down to take it out. There are two 40 mil fans down here. The fans aren't as close to the front of the system as they could be. Um, there may be a design reason for that. It may have just been it satisfies the needs of the design and they stopped there. You lose some of the static pressure performance by seeing them this far back, uh, but you also gain potential flow benefit of spreading it over a wide area. Okay, there goes the shielding for the optical drive. That's where the drive actually inserts. Otherwise, there's nothing in here. This is just standard. And there's the drive itself. Okay, 
that's that one needs to be marked. I wrote big, so hopefully that makes sense to me later when we reassemble it. All right. Optical drive is out. Over the years, consoles have used the optical drives for a lot of their effective DRM and account locking. This is a dev kit though, a little bit of a different story. Okay, safely removed. I think we're gonna take the power supply out now. All that screws, oh, there it is. And then put the parts next to them. Benefit of a glass table. I guess you could also do this on your fancy wood tables uh, one time, but you could still do it. Okay, some shielding, RFEMI type stuff. So that's coming out. There's this big kind of complex shell to basically house all of these cables. And that's gonna be our power in and out of the whole system. One, the larger one has a clip. All right, so for pinout, it's actually labeled really well. That's nice. So it says ground, 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 and then the rest are 12 volts, eight pins for the power. So it's all 12 volts and ground. Got some sticking through here. It's actually, it's easier to see on this side. So labeled on the back side as well. Easy probe points if you ever wanted to DMM this thing. And then the upper, Cable is also labeled for the pinout, so that's pretty awesome that they put this on there. It makes it very easy for a technician to troubleshoot if they needed to, although they're not sold to the public. There's our fans. That's driving all of the intake we've found so far into the system. There might be more in here somewhere. It's 240 mils. So power supply spec is right here. So the consumer PlayStation 4 Pro, just looking it up online, is a 310 watt power supply. Technically that 12 volt line, we just calculated it, can go up to 330 watts. And then the 4.7 by 3 can do another 14 watts or so. Very simple interior shell. So they've got one cable run cutting across this whole thing diagonally. And that's the wireless antenna. And then another one for the other part of the wireless or Bluetooth uh, running this way. We might be as far as we can get without doing the screws on the underside of the chassis here, other than the antenna a lot better cable routing than oh no wait i can't talk about that one yet okay so now i'm just going to disconnect everything that's wired up around here including the rest of the wireless antenna oh this is a lot lighter without the power planet all right now we're going to take out these two plus the next six on the sides so we'll just kind of fast forward through this section i won't comment it Oh, nice. All right. That's actually constructed really well. And we also just got to the super interesting part, which is, uh, it looks kind of like plumbing for the, the PS4 Pro dev kit. But there it is, a giant Nidec fan. They're still using Nidec in the PS5s today. And they're still using giant blower fans that are, uh, actually, they've got a couple different models we've looked at in the past. But this particular one, is fed in through a very large vented opening on this is the back on the back of the device. So we'll have to look more closely to see sort of where where is the air coming in and how is it feeding through what components is it feeding through. We'll do that as we start taking it apart more. That's the the first sort of real cooling component we've seen in here other than those smaller fans for the power supply. So on this side here, this is up against the power supply fans. So that's feeding the power supply with air. And then on this side, the fin stack is in here for the actual silicon components. So this is where the air is going to be going out from the blower fan. The blower fan is pulling air in through anywhere it can at this point. So it's just a natural pressure system where uh, there's holes, the air is going to find its way in, it's going to find its way to, uh, to the fan eventually, and that's going to be through these cuts and wherever else is open in the case. So that's how we think this works. So the fan ends up being a unique size, 70 millimeters. Please hit 70. Okay, there we go. Now we're safe. Take that, YouTube commenters. It's, no, no, it's 70. Okay, 70 inner diameter. And now 
this time to take it apart. All right, we're going to start with the fan. Here comes the fan out of the uh, spot. I don't know, it's not too different from the, um, from the one they're using on the PS5. A little bit, but similar approach of large blower fan move air fast. Fan spec, I think it says 12 volts, 2.1 amps, 24 watt fan, which is pretty damn high. As far as fans go, most of them are like 0 0.3, 0 0.5 for axial stuff. So there's a screw way down in there. Oh, Phillips, okay. Now we've got power, which is this red and black, next to data, which is just the SATA cable. Okay, that was simple. So this is going to be just another uh, antenna. There's a couple clips on the front, plastic clips. What is that? That's oh, the fan. Yeah, it looks like this whole faceplate is just going to pop out. So there's just plastic clips for that. Pretty easy. There's a faceplate. So that's the. Uh, that's the interesting part that if we were gonna split it up permanently, that would be frameable. Interesting stuff for the for the buttons. I mean, so the way they work, there's a little plastic spring retaining these where like J on each side shape, it pushes in as a spring to retain the button itself and then obviously press the internal switch, which we'll look at in a second. This one was manufactured a little earlier in the year, closer to July. And I think this is going to start pulling apart, so I'll just let that down carefully. Power cables come through. There is the entire internal plastic part of the chassis. Okay, so there's some LEDs here. These are just numbered 0 through 7, just like they are on the faceplate of the board, the front of the, the console. There's uh, the network and the reset switches, power, reset, eject, oh, that says recover, actually. And then up here, we have a, looks like a wireless card to me, right there. Yeah, this is starting to really look like a PS5. PS5 has incredibly similar internal design where it uses a metal chassis that's sort of got this stamped upward motion that you can see on this one. All right, so these screws come out now, just like the PS5, almost clamshell style. These are all pinching it together. Okay, let's see. Well, definitely standoffs here. I feel like if we show these too much, we're going to get demonetized. So that contacts. That is actually a thermal, that's like the saddest thermal contact in the world. So technically it does contact a the thermal pad. I thought it would be directly to the memory, but it's not. It's to a tiny thermal pad that's smaller than the memory on top of a metal plate. And probably underneath this, there's gonna be another thermal pad or thermal putty. So it's gonna be memory, interface, metal, interface, metal, eventually air. Horribly inefficient, but I'm, these weren't particularly hot components, so I guess that worked. Some leftover flux or something on the board too, but that's okay. All right, there's the back plate coming off. So the trick for that was a small bump with a flathead. And now I have to do it again. All right, there you go. Now we're somewhere useful. All right, there it is. So we still haven't gotten to the actual CPU and the heatsink that I'm really interested in, but you can see the pitiful amount of contact between these tiny thermal pads. This is pre-thermal putty for Sony days. Contact in the memory modules, and then that contacts this metal plate, which again goes through interface to metal plate again, and then eventually cooling. For memory, I think the standard PS4, the original ones at least, had 16 half gigabyte modules. And this one's probably just going to be the more recent one, which was eight one-gigabyte GDDR5 memory chips. 
so that's me the difference there unless there's more on the other side or something. Okay. This construction is very similar to the PS5. Okay, there we go. A little bit of finesse here because it's got to back out from the I.O. There it is. There's the VRM. So you got some MOSFETs, some blocky inductors, some filtering caps. The VRM is split between two sides. I'm guessing one might be core and one might be MEM. Uh, it's an inefficient VRM layout, at least compared to modern standards, where now they would try to get a more even distribution on both sides of the die, or ideally on the, the uh, lengthwise side of the die, so that there's more even spread for power delivery to the core, and it's more efficient that way. Uh, and then you'd get some memory VRM components spread out somewhat evenly across the area the memory, VR, the memory is actually located. This looks like either a humidity sensor or a post buzzer. OK, so we just looked up the memory module data sheet. It's actually an 8 gigabit or 1 gigabyte module. There are eight of them on this side. And then there's eight of them on this side. So it's a total of 16 gigabytes. It's actually, I, that's a lot for a PS4 Pro. It's more than the uh, stock amount, which is supposed to be just half of that as far as, um, as far as noted here. So it should just be half of that memory. That's not non-standard for developer kits. Typically, they come with more memory. The Xbox that we opened up did as well. And that's so the developers have more to work with as they are developing their games. There's a toggle in the software as well that allows you to do a larger or a normal memory mode. And that's probably related to this capacity. Let's clean off the die and just look at that. And then we'll look at the cooling and we'll be done. This video is approaching uh, probably like two hours of recording time now. We're going to cut it down a lot, as you all will know. And um, people always like to say, I would watch the full uncut version, to which I say, you would only do that if you want unscrewing ASMR or something like that, which probably will also get me demonetized for saying. So there's the actual APU. Says Sony's name on it. It's got model number. Let's go ahead and look at that. CXD90044GC is the model they've written on it. Die size externally at the diffusion barrier. Approximately 23.0 by approximately 14.9 or so. Let's look at the actual cooler, though. Why is everything designed to be a pain in my ass? <laughs> we have to. I really want to see the other side of this thing, so we're going to go ahead and finish this teardown. All right, so the large plate comes off. No interface at all between these. That's really unfortunate. So, God, this is horribly inefficient. This is like one of the worst designs I've ever seen for syncing memory. So, I mean, they've got the memory into a pad into maybe a tin or aluminum, possibly plate. Really looks like tin, though, or stainless. And then that does not connect to an interface. You can see the stamp outs where the memory's uh, on the other side, though. And um, then that connects to the uh, copper block here, which is going to be the cold plate for the CPU, for the APU. So APU sinks into this. The memory for at least this side is also indirectly sinking into it, but there's not much contact area despite all the surface area, and there's no interface to connect the two. That goes into two massive heat pipes. These look like, I don't know, these look like they might be tens. Holy crap. That's a 12 mil, <laughs> that's a 12 mil heat pipe. That is the biggest heat pipe I have ever personally seen on an electronics product. Typically, we see six or eight. Now, 12 doesn't necessarily mean better. For example, they could have run multiple sixes per 12 or maybe three eights or something. So it's not always necessarily better to go with a larger heat pipe. Uh, sometimes it can be, though. It just depends on what their design goals are. Ultimately, the, the objective is to get as much copper heat pipe contact through the contact patch of the die as possible. All right, here we go. Moment of truth for the part I, I personally was the most interested in. All that work. 
There it is. So pretty similar. That is not my hair. Uh, it didn't look like it came from someone's head either. So this is a large, uh, low density fin stack at the, I think it's the back of the device. I've gotten all turned around now. It looks like the back. So large, uh, low density, it means the fin space is pretty far apart as we've talked about before. This you see on other designs as well, like PS5. They've got the big heat pipe running through down on this side and a little bit shorter one out this way. And uh, so what's happening is all the heat's getting sunk through this copper cold plate into the heat pipes. The heat pipes, this is the um, evaporator end. They'll carry it down to the condenser end. The air blowing through this fin stack is cooling off the contacting copper plate, which is soldered or welded to the fin stack and therefore cooling off the heat pipes so that the liquid inside can uh, follow capillary action and end up back where it started. Now on the top, it's actually pretty interesting too. First of all, look at those heat pipes. Those things are insane. And they're not even the flat kind, they're like semi-flat. Uh, so you got another fin stack with sort of the pin fin style on top the flip side of the SOC. So this is also contributing to the cooling. This is aluminum though, and it's just welded in place it looks like. So some extra utilization of the surface area they have, definitely credit for that. They're trying to make use out of all the space they have uh, as close to the SOC as possible, I should say that, because there's a lot more space in the device, but the point is this is close and they can execute it in a way that's probably a little more affordable. Is it like this? I guess so, that's kind of cool too. So they punched out all the corresponding holes in here for those pins to sit through and then the air will go over them and dissipate. So, I mean, that's pretty neat. I like the design for the cooler given how compact it is. I do think that the memory is some of the most horrifically inefficient cooling I've ever seen on a device anywhere. But, uh, I mean, it's a dev kit, so maybe that's their argument. All right, so that's it for the teardown of the PS4 dev kit. This took a really long time and we're gonna have to cut it down a lot. We're gonna shoot for 30 minutes, see how it goes. So I'm gonna keep the conclusion short so we can keep the content long. But the most interesting aspect is the double the memory capacity of what we were expecting versus the consumer model. Pretty interesting cooler design for the SOC. Bad for the memory, but probably sufficient given the purposes of a dev kit. And otherwise, it's an interesting box that we think was an inspiration for what led to the PS5 design that we saw for its thermal solution and the teardowns we did uh, about a year or two ago. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more content where we take apart unique things like this and look at PC hardware. And you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.